Um, there's a lot of stuff that Lightroom is capable of that you can do in Bridge as well. One of the things I find kind of chaotic about Lightroom is the whole catalogs and stuff, and someone this morning was having trouble with, uh, they were getting catalogs all over the place, and they'd moved something on one of their hard drives and it lost the connections. Bridge works differently than Lightroom. It's what we call browser-based, which means that it will look for files wherever they are. So if you're doing a search for uh, you know, images that you would keyword with specific keywords or images that were shot on a certain date or shot with a specific camera, and it's on a hard drive somewhere, you can connect that hard drive to your computer and it'll search across everything that's connected until it finds it. Uh, Lightroom works in a bit of a different way. It's database driven. So it's got that Lightroom catalog and it knows about the photos that you've told it about. So anything that you've imported, um, either by directly moving it into the catalog itself or by simply adding it where it knows where the file is and knows stuff about it. Uh, it can find them faster, but the downside is you have to have told Lightroom about it. You have to have imported it into the catalog. Now, with Bridge, we took a look at things like um, getting images into it. Like if I wanted to look at the images in this add files folder here, I could simply drag it into the favorites. And I could put it directly onto the desktop. You can see how that highlights into the documents folder. But if I go in between, when I get that thick yellow line, when I let go, it just adds it into my favorites folders there. And from there, I can look around through the images. It has some features similar to Lightroom in the sense that you can organize your images. Lightroom is more of a start to finish workflow. Bridge as well, you can keep track of your folders. Um, and let's say you shot a wedding and there was like 50 shots of the outdoor uh, group shots that you want. But instead of having all 50 images spread out, you can create stacks in Bridge. And I think you can create stacks in Lightroom as well. But let's say I selected, let me just shrink this down a little bit here. Let's say I took all of these images here. These are all one group. If I right click under stack, I can group them as a stack. And this shows me that I have five images in that stack there. And with this little slider, I can click and I can drag through and see all the different images that are in that stack. If you've done a time lapse, I mean, a lot of cameras nowadays have features for doing time lapses built right into it, where you can say, you know, take a picture every three seconds for this many frames or record for this long. And it'll actually put it into um, a movie file for you. But if you have an intervalometer on your camera, you can tell it, take a picture every three seconds. It'll just be a regular photograph. You can group them into a stack. Like let's say, for example, um, this is an example that I did for um, a client a while back. It was a medical device. And I photographed it from all different angles. And if I were to bring that folder into Bridge, there we go. And if I were to stack up all those images, now these actually I had previously stacked. If I click on the numbers here, it folds it back up into the stack. And if this preview is big enough, if you've got a fairly small preview, you don't get that little movie strip thing at the top. But if your previews are a little bit larger, when you hover over, there's that bar, and we can use this to see all the images in sequence. Plus, with this little arrow here, if I click play, it'll actually cycle through all the different images. Right now, it's set to the default frame rate stack frame rate, which is uh, two frames per second. But if this was a video that I knew was going to play at 24 or 30 frames per second, I could set it to, in this case, 24 frames per second. When I hit play, we get a bit of a preview of what that's going to look like. So let's say you had your camera set up on an intervalometer and you were just filming the sunset. You didn't know how long it was going to be. So you have like, you know, 3,000 photographs in that sequence of the sun kind of coming down and disappearing below the horizon. You can stack them all and just hit play. You can preview it at different frame rates. Uh, that's the kind of thing that you could then take into Premiere as a sequence and turn it into an actual video file. But it's not a video file here. It's just this folder with 36 images in it. We talked about being able to move these little panels around. Like right now, this is my content over here. And these are my previews. So if I select just one image, there's my preview for it. And we talked about this little loop icon here, this magnifier, and how we can use that to zoom in on things. If I wanted my preview and content to switch. I can grab these tabs. I can drag them around. There's the content over here now. I can pop the preview up on the side over there. And we've got a lot of control over that. And there's different viewing modes as well. One of them is film strip, where we have all these images across the bottom here. Uh, we can create that ourselves from the essentials. I can take my content, drag it down to the very bottom, and you see how we get that blue line. This tells me that it would put it into this window over here. If I go up really high, this tells me that it would put it in a new section above the preview window, or if I drag it down to the bottom here, when we get that little bar, it will put it, it needs to have at least a couple windows in there. So I'll put the preview back in here. I'll drag the content down below. So there's my film strip across the bottom. 
and there's that preview up top. So you can arrange this any way you want. If you like that workspace, under the window menu, you can go under workspace, and you can save that as a new workspace. So let's say you found your panels exactly the way you like them, you can save that as a new workspace. I'm just gonna reset that one, because I don't want to save it. Some other things you can do with this. You'll notice when you preview in on an image, I'm actually going to put my preview back over here because I like my preview on that side. But when you zoom in, let's say you've shot a wedding and you got like, you know, 1,500 images that you got to go through. One of the things you don't want to do is send the client anything that's out of focus or has um, blinking eyes. The main reason for the no out of focus, if you just do a big web gallery or send them all the JPEGs and they look through, and one of them is a little bit soft, a little bit out of focus, they're probably gonna choose that one simply because the skin looks smoother, it looks overall better at this viewing distance. And then they say, that one, that's the one we want. Can you make us like a 16 by 20 print of that? And of course you look at it up close and suddenly it's, oh, it's out of focus. Can you guys pick a different one? They're like, that's the one we wanted. Um, so you don't wanna send out out of focus ones. By using this loop here, by using the magnifying glass, you can click. And you know, say it's like a group shot where there's like you know a bunch of people are all standing in roughly the same position. You go through image by image by image. This will stay in the same position as you go through the different images, and you can say, okay, this one's in focus. We're good. In focus. In focus. Oh, this one's out of focus. You can delete it. Uh, this one. You, oh, this one's fantastic. You can assign the rating to it. You can say, well, let's give this one a, you know, a five star rating. There we go. You'll see the little stars at the bottom, so you can click on it and say, that one's fantastic. So you can set all your rankings. You can get rid of the ones that are out of focus. Or if you put it over someone's eyes and you see that their eyes are blinking, you can get rid of that image there. So there's a lot of ways of kind of quickly going through this. But one of the things you might notice, let's say you're working with raw files, every time you go to the next image, it starts out kind of blurry, kind of out of focus. It waits a few seconds, and then it suddenly sharpens up. Oh, there we go. That's because it has to generate a full-size preview. This is one-to-one, -one, or what we call 100%. So every pixel on this image is being represented by one pixel on your screen. Uh, and you may find that when you go to a new image, have you ever noticed that it's a little bit out of focus, and then it suddenly sharpens up? That's it building a preview from the image file itself. And if it's raw, it could take quite a long time. At the top there, you'll see these little kind of checkerboard pop-tart kind of shapes there. This one will force it to use the embedded images. Every time you take a photograph, whether it's a JPEG, a RAW file, a DNG, it creates a little low-res JPEG preview. Even on a RAW file, it creates this little preview. And that's what it'll call up fairly quickly. So if you just, say, done some sports photography and you want to find that exact moment where the guy's, you know, jumping in the air and catching the ball, tell it to prefer the little embedded. You can flip through really fast, find the ones you like. But when you're ready to figure out which ones are in focus, which ones are your favorite, you can tell it to high quality on demand. So when you hover over it, you'll see that little wait, pause, and then the sharper one will appear. Or if you've got some time to kill, let's say you just got back to the studio, you've got everything downloaded, uh, and you're going to go have some lunch, tell it to generate 100% previews. And it'll go through every image that's in that folder, or if you've told it to look into subfolders, every image that's in all the folders that are in that main folder. So if your wedding has, you know, uh, Benny and June's wedding, and inside that there's, you know, the bride's house, the ceremony, the reception, it'll go through all those different folders. It'll generate a 100% preview. So when you flip over to this loop mode, it'll see it pretty much instantly. Bang, it'll be right there. You can go through really fast and get rid of the ones that are out of focus. It will take up some space on your computer. It will generate what's called a cache file, and it'll put that cache file in whatever folder the images are in, but you won't see it because it's an invisible file. All operating systems have invisible files. You may have noticed if you get a, a USB key from one of your Macintoshes and you put it into your friend's Windows machine, there's this .ds underscore store file on it. Your friend's like, what is this file in here? That's what tells the Macintosh where to put the icons on the screen. It's something that it's invisible, you don't see it, but the Mac sees it. Um, Windows has their own uh, desktop.ini folders. That cache folder will be invisible unless you go under View and Show Hidden Files. And at the beginning, you should see, there it is. There's the .ds store, there's the bridge sort. There's no cache file right now because I didn't tell it to make one, but if I tell it to generate those 100% previews, uh, it's just warning me that generating them speeds the loop and zoom operations, but it uses more disk space and initial processing time. So that's okay. It'll go through, it'll generate that preview, and you'll actually get a larger, um, uh, it'd be a .cache file in there. By default, you can tell it to get rid of those cache files over, you know, say like 30 days after they're done, you can get rid of the cache files. Or you can go through and you can actually purge the cache at any time. You can tell it, you just get rid of everything that's in the cache folder there. Under the preferences, you'll find a lot of things about how it's going to deal with those, like under cache, 
Uh, you can tell it to keep those 100% previews all the time. You can tell it to export that cache to the folders when possible, meaning it'll put that little invisible file in there. You can also tell it only keep a certain number of them. If you're doing a lot of image editing for like this, uh, newspaper or something or a magazine, you're going through like a whole bunch of images, but you never need to use them again, you can keep that number fairly low. But if you're a photographer who goes back to, you know, say like wedding stuff, and you know, oh, this client from a few years back, they want this image, and you want those images to be browsable fairly quickly, you can tell it to keep more images in the cache. The downside being uh, you'll get more of your hard drive being filled up with these cache files. You can tell it to compact the cache. It'll get rid of things that are over a certain date. You can tell it how old they have to be before it gets rid of it. You can tell it to purge them older than 30 days. Lightroom will have similar sort of features. A lot of this stuff will be kept in the Lightroom catalog, and you can tell it to get rid of it if it's beyond a certain age. Uh, I think that's pretty much it for the preferences there. Oh, actually. When a camera is connected, launch Adobe Photo Downloader. In Lightroom, you can tell it to call up the import dialog when you put a card into your computer or when you connect a camera to your computer. Bridge has a similar sort of feature. If I were to check this box, when a camera is connected, launch Adobe Photo Downloader. When I connected a camera or clipped in a, a memory card, if I click this, this window, actually, hang on a sec, oh, aha. That's the icon for the photo downloader there. You can also go under File and choose get photos from camera. It's asking, do you want photo downloader to automatically launch whenever a camera or card reader is connected? Uh, a few years back, I was doing a job with another photographer. He was photographing, it was a corporate banquet thing at the Liberty Grand in Toronto. And we were doing prints the night of and putting them into folios for the people to get after the banquet. And he was coming back with card after card. So we had a roll of duct tape sitting there and he would put the cards into the roll of duct tape. That was our professional inbox. And we had a roll of gaffer tape that I would put the cards into once they were cleared. And the photo downloader made it really easy to get the cards in, backed up, copied, uh, all the files renamed and back into service. And I'll just show you how this photo downloader works. If I were to hit yes, I'm not going to hit yes because that would annoy the heck out of me. So I'm going to say no. But if you had yes, as soon as you put a card into the computer, this would pop up. And it would say get photos from, and it would have whatever card you would put in listed there. And you can tell it where you want those to go. So if you're shooting a wedding, you can have you know, the Benny and June wedding folder in there. Uh, just select it from there. You can also tell it to create some subfolders, either with the date or specific names. And here's a cool thing. You can have it rename the files. So your camera by default names things, you know, IMG underscore 4782.CR2 or whatever kind of camera you've got. Uh, you can say, well, call it Benny and June with a, a serial number after that, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so you can put custom names into there. If you're going to do that, this is a good time to do it. We talked about the idea of renaming RAW files when you're exporting them from camera RAW. That's not a good time to rename your files because then whatever you've exported won't match your raw file names. But this is the raw files as they're coming into the computer. So you can rename them here. You can tell it to automatically open Bridge once it, once it finishes importing them so you're ready to go through and start making your selects. I wouldn't worry about the convert to DNG. Delete original files. Okay, that may make you seem a little bit nervous. You know, the photographer comes over, hands you the card, you pop it in, it mounts up. It'll copy all the files onto your computer and then it'll delete the files that are on the card. And you're like, but then they're only on my computer. But look at this, save copies to. So you got it downloading to this folder. You can say, well, save another copy to, let's say you have an external hard drive connected to your computer. Save it to my computer on this folder, but also save it to the external hard drive. That way you've got it in two places. So if on the way out someone trips and you, you knock that hard drive on the floor, oh, you still got it on your computer. If you've got that hard drive in your pocket and your laptop bag over there and somebody steals your laptop bag, you still got it on this hard drive here. Whenever your files are in at least two places, you're pretty safe. And that's when you're okay to tell it to automatically delete the original files. So the photographer comes by, you pop in the SD card that's full of photos. This thing pops up, you just said get media. It downloads them to two different places, erases them from the card, you eject the card. And in our case, I put it into the um, roll of gaffer tape there. He knew that these cards were ready to get back into the camera and start shooting again. So that can save you a little bit of time. Or if you're in the studio, come back to the computer, just clip it in, hit Get Media, it downloads it all for you. Under Advanced, there's a few other options in there. We talked about the idea of creating those metadata templates. So if you do a whole lot of like, you know, baby photos and wedding work and you know, engagement portraits, and you have different contact information for each one, any of those templates that you've created, and I think I created some sample ones like, yeah, contact info, portrait, wedding, you can tell it, assign that template to all those images as they're being imported. 
You know, you can put in your name as the creator. Uh, you can put in, you know, this is copyright so-and-so, and that will automatically get put into those images as they're being imported. So you don't have to worry about afterwards going in, selecting all those files and applying the template. It happens in real time as you're importing them. And if you tell it, yes, open that whenever a card is inserted, every time you pop in a card, that window will pop up and it'll be ready to download. We looked at the review mode. So when you're in review mode, you can use the arrow keys to really quickly pop through all the different images in there. You'll notice the uh, invisible files are popping up as well because they told it to look at invisible files. But you can then assign rankings to them. So this is a faster way of going through the individual images rather than um, using the loop option. Although there is the loop here, and if you're looking at the eyes on every single image to make sure they're in focus, you can cycle through. And if, oh, if it's in focus, you can hit the down arrow key to drop it out of the list there. We took a look at collections. Let's say you're doing a, a portfolio of images. You're going to do um, all the different food photography that you've done over the years. And you've got stuff on folders and, and hard drives all over the place. You don't want to have to copy them all to your internal hard drive just to work with them and create this portfolio. With a collection, you can make a collection and call it maybe food promo and throw in whatever images you want into there. Let's say, so this here was one of the ones that you liked. Throw it into that collection there. And you can find things from different folders, different hard drives all over the place. They'll all end up in this collection, but they haven't moved from their original location. So when you're done, you can simply delete that collection and the files are they're right back where they had originally been. They've never moved anywhere. Another cool thing about this though, if you're doing a search, well, let's do it right from within um, a smart folder. If you're doing a search, you can tell it where to look uh, you know, individual hard drives. You can tell it to look in your uh, Mac HD. If you go to uh, Greg Dambrick, it should look through anything that's connected to your computer. And you can choose specific criteria. You know, uh, let's say you, you did a, a big travel trip where you've been doing some mountain climbing and you, or you're looking for this, you know, wide shot. I, mean, I remember I did a shot from the top of the mountain. It was like wide angle. It was an evening shot. So you can say, okay, well, I want to find that image. I don't remember what it's called. Well, you can set different criteria. So you can say, well, let, let's find one where the, uh, the focal length of the lens was less than or equal to, say, 24 millimeters, because I remember it was wide angle. Uh, add another criteria. And the ISO, I remember it was an evening shot, so I was shooting at uh, 800 ISO or maybe higher. You can say is greater than or equal to 800 ISO. You can add more criteria. You can say the altitude. I remember I shot it from the top of the mountain, and it was a, a 3,000 foot mountain, so you can say you know, it was larger than. You can set all these criteria, and you can tell it, show me these images only if all of the criteria are met, in which case only if it was a focal length less than or equal to 24 millimeters, the ISO was greater than or equal to 800, and the altitude was at least you know, 3,000 meters or whatever, uh, then it'll show it. Or you can say, show me the images if any of the criteria are met. You'll find anything that was 24 millimeters or shorter, uh, no matter what the ISO or the altitude was. If it finds something where the ISO was greater than 800, maybe like some shots around the campfire at the base camp, it'll show you those as well. So you'll get a lot more hits with the any are met uh, than if you choose all. You can tell it to include any subfolders that are in there, any non-indexed files. So if it hasn't already created a cache folder for those things, one of those invisible files, it'll take a little bit longer, but it will look through pretty much everything. And then when you hit save, you can see it starts looking through everything. Again, it could take a while, but anything that meets those parameters, it'll find. And you can rename that, we'll call it Mountain Trip. Okay, I can spell it wrong too. Uh, but you can see it'll go through and it'll find those images. So there's a lot of fairly powerful search features within it. We talked about the idea of assigning uh, the star ratings. And let's say at the end of the shoot, you and the art director had been going through each of the images as the photos were coming in and assigning rankings like, oh, one star, don't like that, two stars, meh. Oh, that's a five star, that's a four star. You could tell it, well, show me only things that have you know, three or more stars. The, the two, one and two stars we don't want or anything that's unranked we don't want, only show me the best ones. So there's some pretty powerful features in Bridge. And myself, because when I'm doing work for other photographers, it's usually they're sending me just the images that they want the actual work on. I don't use Lightroom that much for my professional work. Usually I just call up things in Bridge. From within Bridge, you can go through Adobe Camera Raw just like you can with, uh, if you're bringing it right into Photoshop. And it uses the same camera raw module, whether you're going from Bridge or from within Photoshop. And in fact, if you're using Lightroom as well, it uses the same camera raw module. So when you're using Lightroom, when you're adjusting the white balance and you know, contrast and stuff, the changes that you're making there should also be visible in Bridge if you export an XMP. 
And if you do the work in uh, Adobe Camera Raw from within Photoshop or from within Bridge, and then you go into Lightroom, Lightroom should also see the changes that you made because Adobe Camera Raw is going to create that XMP file. So there is a lot of compatibility between the two. Any keywords that you put in with Bridge will also be viewable in Lightroom. It'll be viewable in Photoshop. It's part of the metadata, so it's in there permanently. I think that should 